The past week has seen an explosion, really an explosion, of anti-Tibetan agitprop pushed by Chinese Communist Party ideologues. What is behind this campaign of racism, dehumanization, hatred? I speak now to expose Chinese Communist Party propaganda about Tibet to show people how it is deeply rooted in racist Chinese settler colonialism, Chinese imperialism, Chinese imperialist thirst for Lebensraum. But first, a quick word on the Dalai Lama. Chinese Communist Party propagandists accuse him of the most heinous act possible. They have waged an eight decade long campaign to smear his name and destroy him. I fervently believe this hate campaign is just another manifestation of that. Just look at the people attacking the Dalai Lama right now. Look at their profiles, look at their past statements. These are Chinese Communist Party propagandists. In some cases, they are actual neo-Nazis. The Chinese embassy in Sri Lanka attacked the Dalai Lama, smearing him as a pedophile. This is despite the fact that the Chinese Communist Party keeps the age of consent in China set at a horrific 14 years. Please, Chinese Communist Party, raise the age of consent in China. You have Chinese Communist Party supporters writing, Buddhism is a sore religion. Thank God this garbage culture is being replaced by a superior one. Just outing their racism for all to see. You have Chinese Communist Party state media apparatchiks like Daniel Dundrill claiming the Dalai Lama has a taste for human skin. Interesting. Let's look at Daniel Dumbrell's past statements. He brags about the fact that he sends his kids to the same elite Chinese schools as Xi Jinping's family members. His kids literally study alongside Xi Jinping's niece. I wonder if he has an ulterior motive to slandering the Dalai Lama. Other Chinese Communist Party propagandists like Danny Haifong claim the Dalai Lama is known for brutality and torture. Danny also claimed Xi Jinping is the most progressive leader in the world. Xi Jinping is anti-war. He upholds socialist thought and practice. He is 1,000 times more progressive than the most left-wing US politician, he says. Very difficult to say, guys, but could this bloke Danny Haifong have an ulterior motive to denounce the Dalai Lama? You also have young CCP propagandists like Kala Walsh, the famous, please don't be mean to me on Twitter for working for Chinese state media. I'm just a little girl. That, that famous lady. She defames the Dalai Lama as a slave-owning pedophile and repeats Chinese propaganda claims that I am a terrorist. Interesting, let's look at her profile. Ah, make sure to tune in to her moderated panel with the Chinese Communist Party International Department at 8.30 a.m. Beijing time, guys. Then you have the far-right extremists defaming the Dalai Lama. Strength Wave Z says Buddhism is a demonic religion and the Dalai Lama is a pedophile. Interesting, let's see some of his past comments. Oh, he likes Hitler and Nick Fuentes. Who could have guessed? Or Proletario One. He condemns the Dalai Lama deception. Let's search his Twitter history for the word Jews. Oh, uh, what do you know? He's a Nazi. Then we have the esteemed Ian Miles Chiong, Elon Musk's top reply guy on Twitter. He condemns the Dalai Lama and tells us, whatever you think of the CCP, China actually abolished slavery in Tibet. What else does this fine ubermensch of pristine Aryan stock have to say about the wonders of colonization, I wonder? I'll never apologize for my Portuguese ancestors who traveled vast oceans to distant lands and brought with them Christianity and civilization while massacring the natives, he tells us. So interesting, he also believes China brought civilization to Tibet. So interesting, he also defends the Chinese genocide against the Uyghurs. Who else? There's Jackson Hinkle, the top FSB bloke in America, retweeting posts describing the Dalai Lama as a demon pedophile. Very interestingly, he has nothing to say about Putin's past creepy behavior around children. And even more fascinating, he likes to hang out with Scott Ritter, twice convicted child sex offender, a bloke who calls for Ukrainians to be executed like rabid dogs. Truly, this is an assortment of some of the finest minds at work today, folks. Crucial, we also do not forget, Ollie London, the bloke who spent $300,000 on plastic surgery to try and make himself look like a male K-pop star before transitioning into a new role as a right-wing media talking head calling for the complete extermination of transgender people. Ollie London has called for the immediate arrest of the Dalai Lama, but I instead call on The Hague to immediately open an investigation into Ollie London for crimes against humanity. Because look at the bloke's head, it's a travesty, a travesty, potentially a violation of international law. We need to use our brains here. The Dalai Lama is 87 years old. He has lived eight decades under the public gaze, advocating for compassion and non-violence. He's a humorous person. The Dalai Lama is known to greet everyone with compassion and affection everywhere he goes. Poking your tongue out to greet somebody has been a part of Tibetan culture for centuries, and the Dalai Lama speaks English as a second language. The Tibetan phrase, Ki li sa, or eat my tongue, is a well-known humorous joke in Tibetan culture, common in the Ando region where the Dalai Lama is from. Of course, we must have zero tolerance for child sexual abuse. This was not a sexual act, however. It was awkward, but it was not in any way a sexual act. Westerners are looking at this from the perspective of a hypersexualized culture in which porn addiction is rife. Perhaps this is why an innocent joke has been sensationalized in such a horrible and defamatory way. In our Tibetan culture, touching our foreheads and kissing signifies the recognition of our proximity and spirituality. 
my parents never said I love you like many Tibetan parents, but they never needed to because our unique customs, beliefs, and our ancient traditional practices of mutual love were constant reminders and part of our daily lives. Whether it be stretching out our arms and bowing to welcome strangers, or touching a friend's shoulder or holding their hands in public as a sign of friendship, or sticking out our tongues as a sign of respect. Must mean hello. These practices might seem backward and weird in today's world, but they are our social norms, our social behaviors. It is what defines us as Tibetans. The viral video doesn't show His Holiness holding the child's hand on to his cheeks and praying with the child and giving him personal advices before tickling him with his uh, larger than life laughter. Now that is exactly how our elders in our communities show affection with our children. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We are same human brother sisters. <laughs> when the boy asked His Holiness for a hug, Can I hug you? As his baffled mother waved at him from the stage, from a seat, uh, uh, one seat away from His Holiness, it literally took two people a couple of attempts to interpret the boy's request. It's a question. <laughs> Okay, come. <laughs> now, His Holiness is not fluent in English. He's a self-taught English speaker. If were there words lost in translation when he said, suck my tongue, the chele sa, eat my tongue? Absolutely, yes, it was. There was words lost in translation. In fact, the boy and his mother spoke to the media just right after the incident. Neither of them felt victimized and both of them spoke of meeting the Dalai Lama in glowing terms. It was amazing meeting His Holiness and I think it's a really great experience meeting somebody with such high positive energy. It's a really nice feeling meeting him and you get a lot of that positive energy. It's not just like that but once you get the positive energy I think you're happier and it's a better thing and you smile a lot more. It was a really good experience of all. I am Dr. Payal Kanodia, trustee M3M Foundation. We have been working in Dharamshala on this uh, skill center which we started last year. And since then we were looking at seeking blessings from His Holiness. And you know today we got this opportunity and especially when my family was there with me. And the, all the students who graduated from I Am Power Academy of Skills were also present. We are totally, totally blessed to have got these blessings from His Holiness. He came, addressed us in person, taught about peace that wo the world needs and how everyone needs to feel together like brother and sister. And I, I absolutely cannot, you know, express how I feel getting blessed by him. Nobody was victimized here, yet Chinese Communist Party propagandists have had a field day attacking Tibetans and their culture as barbaric and savage. Again, we must use our brains. The alleged incident of abuse occurred on February 28th. So you must wonder, why is this coming out now? Why is this carefully edited clip coming out only now? I'll explain to you. Just two weeks ago, the Dalai Lama held an event unveiling the new Jetsun Denpa, the third most important figure in the Tibetan Buddhist religion and the leader of the faith in Mongolia. This is hugely significant because alongside the Panchen Lama, the Jetsun Denpa plays a key role in the selection of the next Dalai Lama, thereby threatening the Chinese Communist Party's ability to rig the selection of the next Dalai Lama. In 2007, the Chinese Communist Party passed laws through its rubber stamp parliament, giving it the power to approve the reincarnation of Buddhist Lamas. Just the sheer spectacle and absurdity of an avowedly atheist Communist Party passing laws governing the reincarnation of the soul is incredible, but the Chinese Communist Party takes this deathly seriously. When the Dalai Lama announced the selection of a new Panchen Lama in 1995, the Chinese Communist Party promptly abducted the six-year-old and made him the world's youngest political prisoner. He has never been heard from again. The same Communist Party officials who denounced the Dalai Lama as a threat to children actually made a six-year-old the world's youngest political prisoner and forcibly disappeared him. This is all part of their program to pacify and subjugate Tibet. 
They want to choose the next Dalai Lama so that they can select a pliant candidate who will not question the ongoing Chinese colonial domination of Tibet. So when the Dalai Lama defies the Chinese Communist Party to announce a new head of the Tibetan Buddhist religion in Mongolia, what happens just two weeks later? Every single Chinese Communist Party propagandist activates an anti-Tibetan agitprop that is truly shocking and founded on pure hatred spews across the airways. Now onto the broader subject of Chinese racist propaganda against Tibet and its racist colonialist foundations. The famous anti-colonial intellectual Frantz Fanon explained how colonization strikes out against the entire existence of conquered people. Colonial domination, because it is total, very soon manages to disrupt in spectacular fashion the cultural life of a conquered people. This cultural obliteration is made possible by the negation of national reality, by new legal relations introduced by the occupying power, by the banishment of the natives and their customs to outlying districts by colonial society, by expropriation and by systematic enslaving of men and women. Sadly, the Chinese common Party appears to have read Fanon's description of how settler colonialism obliterates and annihilates indigenous culture as a program and a guide for their destructive and murderous imperialism in Tibet. The Chinese Communist Party invaded Tibet in 1950, forcing the Tibetan government to sign an unequal treaty demanding Tibet return to the Chinese motherland. Chinese Communist Party loves to moan about the unequal treaties forced upon it by the Western imperialist running dogs during the century of humiliation, but the entire basis of the Chinese claim to Tibet today rests upon an unequal treaty enforced upon the Tibetans at gunpoint. The Tibetans were forced to sign the 17 points agreement after the People's Liberation Army had already invaded the country. According to the Chinese Communist Party view of the universe, Tibet has always been part of China since time immemorial, since the dawn of human civilization, human history. They do not even attempt to explain to us how the Tibetans could have signed such a treaty, abrogating their own sovereignty, had they not been sovereign in the first place. Tibet had its own functioning government, its own functioning legal system, currency and army. It negotiated and concluded diplomatic agreements with foreign powers. Why is it that China had to invade Tibet and subjugate it by force if Tibet had always been part of China since time immemorial? Chinese atrocities began shortly after the invasion and occupation. The Tibetans have their own shorthand for this national catastrophe and cataclysm at the hands of Chinese imperialists, their own Nakba. They call it the Dulok. The collapse of time it is a fittingly haunting expression for a period of tremendous horror. Roughly coinciding with Mao's massively homicidal Great Leap Forward, Chinese occupation authorities confiscated grain and emptied granaries all over Tibet in an attempt to starve the population into submission. The purchase and sale of grain was strictly forbidden, as was cooking at home. Utensils and dishware were confiscated by Communist Party cadres, while nomadic Tibetans were herded into collective farms. The Tibetan experience of forced collectivization was predictably disastrous. The Chinese troops in charge of collectives in Tibet had no experience with farming at high altitudes. Han cadres mocked the Tibetans who had lived off the land for generations as primitive and barbaric, refusing to heed the advice of those telling them crops could not be cultivated on the Tibetan plateau. Quote, as the Han are the bulwark of the revolution, any thinking against learning from the Han nationality and welcoming the help given by the Han nationality is wrong. The sadly predictable result was massive famine and food scarcity that would ultimately haunt Tibet for two decades, calling to mind Stalin's Holodomor terror starvation of Ukraine. The slow strangulation and suffocation of the Tibetan people as a result of this famine sparked resistance that would be brutally cut down by Chinese Communist Party authorities. Party committees set quotas for arrests and local officials worked to exceed these targets, roaming the countryside to make preemptive arrests. According to Barbara Demick, the Tibetans rounded up by Communist Party cadres at this time were held in prisons that amounted to little more than pits in the ground crammed with hundreds of people. In some Tibetan areas, up to 20% of the population were arrested and at least half of them would ultimately die in chains. Here a chilling statistic comes to mind. Chinese journalist Yang Jisheng combed through the Chinese archives eventually accumulating 10 million words of records to conclude that some 36 million Chinese were killed and another 40 million not born as a result of Communist Party policy during Mao's Great Leap Forward. Patrick French's own research and analysis, drawing on Chinese government data and demography by Judith Bannister, found that death rates in provinces with large Tibetan populations were almost double those elsewhere in China during the same period of mass homicide. In 1960, the mortality rates in Sichuan, Gansu and Qinghai provinces, all with large Tibetan populations, were nearly double the national average of 25 deaths per thousand people. In some prefectures, like Yushu, the Tibetan population dropped 41% from 1957 to 1963. Mass shootings and executions accompanied starvation in Tibet as the People's Liberation Army carried out reprisal campaigns against recalcitrant villages that would ultimately recall genocidal massacres of Native Americans by the US Army at Wounded Knee and Sandy Creek. These genocidal killings prompted the Panchen Lama, the second most important figure in Tibetan Buddhism, to warn Mao that the Tibetan people were sinking into a state close to death. 
He was imprisoned and tortured for daring to speak out about the horror. It was at this time of mass murder and genocide that the Chinese Communist Party began to target Buddhist monasteries for destruction as part of a systematic campaign to break the national cultural idea of Tibet. The cultural loss associated with the Chinese Communist destruction of the Buddhist monasteries is indescribable. They functioned as museums, libraries and schools for the Tibetan people. Tibetan Buddhist statues and artworks that would compare with the greatest religiously inspired artistic achievements of Renaissance Europe think the Pieta, the Last Supper, the Sistine Chapel, were systematically smashed, burned and destroyed by marauding Communist Party forces. The Chinese Communist Party will never release statistics revealing the true number of Tibetans murdered as state policy during the Dulok, but estimates range from a lower bound of at least 300,000 Tibetans to over a million. Maps of China from the 1982 census demonstrate that an entire generation of Tibetan men are practically missing. The entire Tibetan plateau is covered red, showing the number of women far outstripping men even decades later. China boasts of the economic development it has brought to Tibet, but the grim irony is that this economic development is built on the bones of the dead. Mass graves are still regularly unearthed today during construction work as new gleaming buildings for Han settlers rise up above ground that was once used for death pits. Barbara Demick writes that the Chinese Communist Party ultimately murdered more Tibetans during the Dulok than Imperial Japan murdered during the atrociously brutal and evil Nanjing massacre. At least 300,000 Tibetans perished as a result of the famine, mass roundups and shootings a figure that rises top to a million by some estimates. The Chinese Communist Party memorializes the Nanjing Massacre to this day and frequently demands apologies from Japan for the horror, but it effectively criminalizes Tibetan historical memory, forcibly repressing all record of the Duluk. In addition to suffering the brutality of military occupation and genocide, the Tibetan people are denied even the most basic dignity of preserving historical memory of their suffering. Survivors were forbidden from memorializing their dead loved ones and forbidden from marking the murder of up to one-fifth of their people in any way. This catastrophe for the Tibetan people occurred because they fell victim to Chinese imperialism and settler colonialism. The barbaric crimes the Chinese Communist Party committed in Tibet make an absolute mockery of their claim to have liberated Tibetans from their cruel feudal overlords. When a people are colonized, they don't just lose their sovereignty, their land and their freedom. As Fanon notes, Colonial domination necessitates a negation of the national reality of the colonized peoples. They must also be subjected to the propaganda and false historical narratives of their captors and slavers. And so the Tibetans have been forced to play the part of the orientalized other, forced to submit to endless infantilized stereotypes and Chinese racial fantasies about their people. John Power here cites laughably stilted Chinese propaganda as depicted in books like Great Changes in Tibet. Quote, before liberation, Tibet was a hell on earth where the laboring people suffered for centuries under the darkest and most reactionary feudal serfdom. Tibetan serfs and slaves were deprived of freedom of the person and lived worse than animals. On top of this, a century of aggression and enslavement in Tibet by imperialist forces plunged the Tibetan people into an abyss of misery. In 1951, Tibet was liberated and imperialist aggressive forces were driven out. This marked the great turning point in the historic development of Tibet. Since then, the Tibetan people have lived with China's other nationalities in the family of the great motherland on the basis of equality, unity, fraternity, and mutual help. This kind of racist, patronizing Chinese colonial propaganda about Tibet has a long history. Pals goes as far back to the writings of Chinese historian Hei Ning in 1792. The customs of the Tibetans are completely abject and despicable, he writes. The people all appear unwashed and uncombed. Their figure resembles a dog or a sheep. Both monks and laity are equally greedy. Tibet is a place where the old is being preserved and nothing changes. All of Tibetan culture and history is presented in Chinese sources as depraved, alien and sinister. Before China, Tibet was hell on earth. These backward savages labored under the darkest and most reactionary feudal serfdom. This racist Chinese propaganda is packaged with utterly obscene atrocity porn. Proclaiming that the Dalai Lama demanded human intestines and the skins of children to celebrate his birthday. Powers here can also cite absurd Chinese claims that the Tibetans operate scorpion torture pits beneath major religious pilgrimage routes in Lhasa. The scorpions would apparently feast on the blood of tortured prisoners and babies, despite the fact that scorpions do not feast on human blood. I mean, China carted out this lunatic QAnon tier agitprop before the world in the lead up to the 2008 Beijing Olympics, putting on Tibet exhibitions at the Beijing Cultural Palace of Minorities, filled with supposed Tibetan torture artifacts and faked evidence of Tibetan human sacrifices. Again, this type of sordid, obscene atrocity propaganda by the Chinese Communist Party has a long history. 
While the CCP were busy torching priceless cultural heritage during the Cultural Revolution, they put on an exhibition of clay statues at the Patella, the Tibetan equivalent of the Vatican, entitled Wrath of the Serfs. These demented clay figurines depicted various reported horrors of feudal Tibet, such as monks apparently burying children alive in the foundations of new monasteries. According to powers in history as propaganda, these figurines were divided into four sections. Feudal estate owners' manners, miserable infernos on earth, llama series, dark man-eating dens, local reactionary government of Tibet, apparatus of reactionary rule, and serfs rise in struggle and yearn for liberation. Foreign tourists were forced to view these demented exhibits until the Chinese Communist Party eventually caught on to the fact that these displays mostly prompted snickering and disbelief among foreign guests. Continued until the 90s, man-eating dens, miserable infernos on earth. It is ironic to think the Chinese Communist Party today feigns indignant outrage at those who call public attention to its very real atrocities against Tibetans and Uyghurs, because for decades the Communist Party was happy to stoke some of the most obscene and horrific atrocity propaganda claims against the Tibetans, such obscene propaganda that it calls to mind Nazi blood libel claims in Der Stuma. Given these absurd claims, it was only natural the Chinese would depict their invasion and occupation as a moral necessity. The culturally sophisticated and advanced Han people, benevolently extending a hand to their little Tibetan brothers and inviting them to the family of the great motherland so as to lift them into modernity. Summarizing this ideology, Powers writes, it is the duty of the Han big elder brothers to incorporate the minorities forcibly if necessary so that as a result of contact and instruction, they will gradually renounce their backward ways and be lifted up to the level of their instructors. Of course, this disgusting racialized Chinese propaganda is simply a repackaged version of the white man's burden colonizer myth, which motivated and inspired Western imperialism all across the world. This myth cast the indigenous peoples of Asia and Africa as inferior and uncivilized, needing the help of the supposedly superior West to modernize and develop. As we all know by now, this vile myth was simply covered for a vast system of violent wealth extraction, legitimizing some of the most utterly depraved and genocidal regimes to ever befell the face of the planet. I mean, the hellish inferno of death associated with Western colonialism in the Americas was so great as to permanently lower the temperature of the planet. Untold millions, tens of millions, were murdered across the Americas, Africa, and Asia, from the ghoulish atrocities of the Belgian Congo to the stolen indigenous children of Australia and Canada. The atrocities and crimes against humanity committed by colonizers in the name of civilizing indigenous peoples are too many to list. It is an extraordinary and distressing state of affairs that many on the left, well versed in this history, stand idly by and shrug their shoulders as the Chinese Communist Party decides to regurgitate this foul propaganda in the name of justifying its horrors in Tibet. Mao comes along and he says, we have to invade Tibet to free the feudal slaves and the collective left are like, oh bro, please, it's not imperialism bro, please, it's a different strain, please, try it bro, please, please, it's different, they've got slaves bro. I mean, this is, this is the reality. Just as Australian and Canadian colonizers stole indigenous children from their families so as to break lines of cultural transmission with colonial boarding schools, China has now separated one million Tibetan children from their families and forcibly placed them in Chinese boarding schools so as to absorb them culturally, religiously and linguistically into the dominant Han Chinese culture. Lessons are conducted solely in Mandarin Chinese so that Tibetan children will forget their native tongue and struggle to communicate with their parents when returning home. Colonial boarding schools in Canada and Australia were genocidal and devastating for indigenous peoples. Physical and sexual abuse were rampant in these horrifying schools and thousands of haunting unmarked graves for children have been unearthed and discovered on the grounds of former colonial boarding schools in Canada. So it is nothing short of terrifying to know that the Chinese Communist Party has studied the genocidal destruction of indigenous peoples in Western settler colonies and concluded in favor of implementing the exact same horrific policies against Tibetans and Uyghurs. Little wonder that Australian historian Patrick Wolfe considered the founder of the field of settler colonialism studies and a strident critic of genocidal settler colonial policies in Australia and Canada, was equally vociferous in denouncing Chinese settler colonialism in Tibet and East Turkestan. Many online Marxist Leninists like to quote Patrick Wolf to denounce Western horrors. Few would enjoy reading what he had to say about Chinese Communist Party efforts to eradicate Uyghur and Tibetan culture. Ultimately, Tibet doesn't need Chinese settler colonialism. It never did and it never will. If the Tibetan people are so happy under Chinese rule, one might ask why hundreds of Tibetans have poured petrol over their bodies and lit themselves on fire in protest against Chinese imperialism. These Tibetan protesters are so despairing of life under Chinese colonial occupation, they choose the most agonizing death possible. 
just as many Africans chose to throw themselves from Western slave ships to drown rather than endure a lifetime of torture and servitude. Hundreds of Tibetans have preferred to burn themselves alive rather than live to see the slow strangulation and annihilation of their people. This is what China means when it speaks of liberation. Annihilation. They make a desert and they call it peace. It is reminiscent of Putin speaking of Russia's supposedly fraternal bond with Ukraine as his brutal soldiers castrate and behead Ukrainian captives. The same Chinese Communist Party that claims to have liberated the Tibetans continues to subject hundreds of thousands of Uyghurs and Tibetans to forced labour and slavery in the present day. The same Chinese Communist Party that claims to have liberated the Tibetan people from slavery presides over a vast system of totalitarianism in which billions are ultimately enslaved to the whims of one man, Xi Jinping. While the Dalai Lama completely democratised the Tibetan government in exile and stepped back from all temporal duties, Xi Jinping has instituted a theocratic cult of personality and worship in which hundreds of millions of Chinese school children are forced to spend hours each day studying his so-called thought as part of the national curriculum. And how are working conditions in today's China under the self-proclaimed dictatorship of the proletariat? As late as 2007, China was scandalised by revelations that thousands of Chinese citizens had been forced to work as slaves in illegal brickyards. To this day, Chinese labourers cannot form independent trade unions. The Communist Party forcibly disappeared young Marxist students who foolishly took the party at its word and tried to organise workers. Forced labour and suicide nets for workers. This is China in 2023. Yet we are supposed to believe the Communist Party invaded Tibet so as to liberate the Tibetan people from serfdom. The hypocrisy is astounding. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the moat out of thy brother's eye. End Chinese settler colonialism in Tibet. End Chinese racism and imperialism towards Tibetans. Let the Tibetan people go. Break their chains. Give them freedom. Free Tibet. Thank you.